Thank you so much, Michael John, and thank you for not revealing how long we have known each other, which would, <laughs> would date me. Um, it's really just such a great pleasure to be here. I think the Science Gallery is the most exciting curatorial space in the world, and this is my first time here and presenting here. And uh, thank you, Michael John, for inventing this space and making it real and making it uh, an incredible space of possibility. Um, what I'll do tonight, is, as Michael introduced, is, is introduce you to sort of my current work or just a, um, a quick survey of some of the projects um, and begin with sort of cueing you to the question uh, that I hope we'll discuss afterwards of, you know, what is science for? Is it a professional activity of, um, of scientists, um, you know, in institutions and in corporations, or is it a cultural resource for each one of us to play with to use, to do what we do. Of course, I subscribe to the latter idea, and um, I hope to illustrate some of the ways that I have played with contemporary scientific concepts to address uh, what I do, which is how we can redesign, reinvent, rethink our relationship to natural systems. Um, and uh, towards that goal, um, I've set up the Environmental Health Clinic, which is a, a health clinic uh, like you find at a university where people come um, with their health concerns, actually their environmental health concerns as opposed to their medical health concerns. And they walk out with prescriptions not for pharmaceuticals, but for things they can do to improve their air quality, water quality, food systems, biodiversity, things that they can do to improve their environmental health. Um, and so it's a, you know, in the tradition of institutional critique, it's rethinking how we might use these. But to sort of motivate this kind of external view of what health is, where we move away from a medicalized view of health, which is internal and atomized and genetically predisposed and individualized, to a collective view of health, external, about the air quality in this room, about the water that you ingest, about the edibles that you explore. Um, I'll actually, I'd like to motivate with um, Philip Landrigan's work, who's one of many people who have kind of described the shift, a major cultural shift that we are still, I think, uh, in uh, digesting. Um, this is a survey of, uh, of um, Manhattan pediatricians and what they do with their time. What do they spend, what do pediatricians spend their time doing? Right. And about 80% of their time is accounted for by meeting with patients with five top conditions. Number one, any guesses? Asthma. Um, the recent epidemic in asthma, where one in three uh, children are affected by reactive airways. Um, number two is developmental delays, ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum, all sorts of issues around. And number three is 400-fold um, increases in rare childhood cancers in the last 15 years. Number four and five are diabetes, which is new childhood diabetes and, and obesity. Six-month-olds with, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating the obesity epi epidemic, right? So what's common about all those things? The environment is radically implicated. It's not the germ theory of health. It's actually not what medicos are trained to deal with at all, right? Uh, so it demands that we kind of address what, how we think of health. Uh, if we use our children as canaries, which is um, not what I'm uh, prescribing, but uh, certainly, um, I think that we can also look to our non-human cohabitants to um, to understand. Uh, our situation very well. Um, and this is actually David Allison, a statistician, looked at 38 species that we cohabit with, that is, feral animals that live with us in urban contexts, from pigeons to coyotes. I don't suppose you have coyotes here, but gray squirrels, and, um, and lab rats and pets, and uh, those animals that share our environment, to see if he could find evidence of the, ep uh, of the obesity epidemic um, in these animals. So do you know how many of those 38 species he found demonstrated evidence of obesity? All of them, exactly. So that suggests that uh, perhaps um, it's beyond diet and exercise that um, uh, is responsible for expanding waistlines as the... But I think actually the serious attention to non-humans uh, is something we have um, not given enough consideration. This is a, um, uh, if you will, a 
biology lesson from pigeons. It's actually a project I did in a couple of different exhibited in the Whitney and in Mass Mocha, which is a perch communication technologies for birds, really to um, to assist. With, you know, we have our cell phones and you know this radical telecom communication revolution and. What do they have? So some communication technologies for birds. This is actually a, um, a perch where they land on it and it triggers a sound file that says something like this. And here's what you need to do. Go down there, buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. <laughs> So there were six of these in the Whitney sculpture court set up. Um, so the birds could sit on different ones and try different arguments. You know, another argument was for the copyright dues for all the melodic resources and cell phone ringtones that have been borrowed from the birds. And, um, but by far the most popular, from the point of view of the birds, um, argument, uh, eight to one, was this one. Tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. So, um, of course, it's taken us a while, I think, to understand uh, now that we've kind of built these cauldrons of pathogenicity and produced things like the avian flu and swine flu by, uh, you know, by our own hand, right? Producing intensified uh, agriculture systems where you put many organisms very genetically similar without UV sterilization of the sun right next to each other in in a different wild context, uh, if a virus is too pathogenic, it will kill the animal too quickly, right? If it's, so it won't, it won't propagate, right? So there's natural limits, and uh, uh, but we've done something very different with our industrialized food production, and I would argue that the birds have demonstrated, or at least illuminated, that we could and should redesign, rethink um, so the clinic um, <clears throat> builds on this kind of bird knowledge, if you will, to really th think about, I think, what is perhaps the most um, insidious effect, uh, something that's been revealed by the climate crisis, a more insidious crisis, the crisis of agency, what to do, what does any one of us individually, collectively, institutionally do. Um, and this crisis of agency is, is where we, um, the environmental health clinic kind of sits, um, where uh, this is actually one of the um, clinics. We have these field offices that we set up. This is a field office in the uh, East River. Uh, this is a very good place to talk about water quality, um, sitting on a raft two litre bottles, because of course you can see the CSOs and the water treatment facility and the, the material evidence of what we're dealing with immersed in this context. Here's another uh, set up in Belgium where we have um, a field office in uh, set up in a roundabout, a very interesting place to talk about air quality and experience the issues with air quality. But also, I, 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 I like this as an icon, a uh, very familiar re-scripting of an urban space that demonstrates something very critical, and that is the phenomena of headless social movement. The idea at a red light traffic intersection where you have delegated your capacity to make a decision to some remote authority that will tell you if it's safe to go, even though it's you, your car, your health, your property at risk. You can't decide that it's safe to go even if there's no cars there, right? That's, um, uh, but in the uh, roundabout, of course, you have invented in Australia. That's my one bit of patriotism. <laughs> Uh, but not very um, space effective. But in the roundabout, you, it depends on each one of us making a decision. And of course, we get higher throughput and fewer accidents at this sort of intersection, demonstrating the real value of headless social movement 
it does work. And um, so that's an interesting reminder and I think a potent social force to harness towards addressing the major challenges we face this century. Um, uh, so I want to introduce you to a current show. This is actually a current um, field office that we're um, do, uh, using, um, meeting up here, uh, actually going through um, the strata. Um, this is great views actually at the zoning height limit of Long Island City, which is currently where I'm doing. Uh, I have an exhibition, a series of exhibitions, developing an urban plan and meeting with um, impatients. So people actually who come to the clinic are called not patients, but impatience, because of course they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address shared environmental health. Um, and so at the clinic we do things like develop um, ways to monitor and understand the complex socio-ecological systems in which we're immersed. This is one of one such project actually, and I, let me, I think I skipped it. Sorry, I've got a missing slide. Well, let me go back to here. This is one of the prescriptions that comes out of the clinic. Um, apologies. Um, called the no-park prescription. And it takes a, a no-parking space, like those associated with a fire hydrant or emergency vehicle parking space, and prescribes the removal of the asphalt to create an engineered microlandscape to um, intercept roadborne pollution. And this is because of this phenomena that you would be very familiar with. which is uh, now actually in our industrial and uh, urban centres, uh, this is the major pollution burden on urban bodies of water. It's no longer the point sources, the big industrial facilities, but the massive networks of, of surfaces, impervious surfaces that we call roads and sidewalks that gather uh, you know, cadmium neurotoxicants from brake liners and oily hydrocarbon waste and washes that through into our stormwater systems and into our bodies of water. So that actually requires a radically different approach than the traditional environmental movement, which is find the big polluter, sue the deep pockets, and somehow fix it. You know, we are all implicated in the use of roads and urban surfaces, so how do we address that? Who do you sue, right? You can sue me, but won't <laughs> won't do anything. Um, so the, this no park prescription uh, prescribes that these um, these um, engineered micro landscapes that uh, infiltrate that roadborne pollution before it can enter into the aquatic ecosystem and has all that terrestrial, all that surface area of the gravel and the soil and, and uh, to grab all those. Um, heavy metals and neurotoxicants before they, that's what terrestrial ecosystems are very good at doing. So what happens is Muki is an inpatient in the environmental health clinic. She sets up a no park in the, in the site that she wants to and, and, and talks to her neighbours about it, her block association. What we do is we addition, um, uh, this is another one of the no parks actually where each no park is designed for a particular site. This is uh, planted in phenological order, so it's a series of plants in stripes that is um, uh, that blooms in calendrical order, um, and then it's additioned with a uh, thumbnail tattoo. So this is the blooming schedule of what's due to bloom. Your thumbnail grows at about two millimetres a month, so you can actually walk past and see what's due to be blooming. Check it on your thumbnail tattoo. Um, so, uh, actually, now I've, I do have this out of order. This was the monitoring protocol I was going to um, show you, but just let me go back to the, to the uh, no park. What Muki did was addition a, an image, uh, limited edition print, a share print, that on one side looked like, looked, was an image of what the no park could look like, and on the other side looked like a share or stock certificate. Um, and she sold those to her at $20 each. She did 200 of them. That's uh, four thousand dollars, which is the entire implementation cost of the no park. But what that achieves, this share print, is actually to change who, not only who paid for the no park, but who owns it, right? And one of the big lessons in working in this field is that we don't have agency as individuals, right? It's a, uh, we don't count in transforming our urban material context in changing our urban future. We have to 
operate as small collectives to have any political force, to go to the Department of Transportation, to go to the community board to actually get these things in requires structuring participation in a way that goes beyond an individual, which was an interesting lesson. Uh, this is um, another monitoring protocol called the Clear Skies Mask, which is actually uh, in the US, the Bush administration had an initiative called the Clear Skies Initiative, which is a um, just a tremendous, uh, I think, illustration of the crisis of representation. The Clear Skies Initiative, which was effectively the dismantling of the Clean Air Act, um, you know, sounds like the Clear Skies Initiative. Clear Skies sounds good, right? Clean Air sounds good. Who would, who would know that Clear Skies was actually 17-fold increases in emissions from coal-fired power plants? Who would know that Clear Skies meant more pollution, right? Orwell would call that double speak, and I would call that the contemporary political condition, right, where complex environmental issues are poorly represented in public um, discourse. Um, so when words are failing, we addition these, uh, these masks, which have been, they're a standard N95 particulate matter mask, which uh, is used in OSHA approved, the, um, the workers, I don't know what the equivalent is, but uh, a standard um, mask that captures particulates. Um, we've adapted it by screen printing on a grayscale. Um, so as you wear it around, the grime that appears on the mask that would otherwise lodge in your pretty pink lungs gradually accumulates. You can read that off against the grayscale and get a stochastically robust measure of the actual black carbon, the particulate loading, the air quality that you yourself are exposed to. You can compare it to your friend who commutes on the bicycle to work. You can compare it to um, someone who has a shorter commute, you can actually start to make sense in a material representation of what air quality actually means. Um, this is actually another more recent project, we've just been prototyping it, um, which plays in this uh, different end of this about who and where information is placed and who can respond to it. Um, so this takes the POV display that we've adapted to bike wheels. Um, which is, um, we actually have, this is the 32 LED one, um, and of course creates a, um, what we call occupies, which are um, representations that uh, are real. So it's essentially a little bit of Times Square in your bike wheel, which makes you more visible, but is um, a geolocated real-time indicator of some information. So the first one we've just been releasing is um, traffic fatalities. As you ride your bike through an intersection, it shows the traffic fatalities at that intersection, and then a set of projects that you uh, can do locally to improve the infrastructure for um, changing urban mobility. Um, it's really been an interesting project to understand how um, in both Toronto and New York City, which are the two cities I've been working in recently, the um, surprising to me that traffic fatalities, more than all the uh, drivers and motorbike uh, my, and cyclists, you know, 60% of all traffic fatalities are pedestrian which is um, shocking to me. Uh, anyway, I want to show you this, an, another monitoring protocol that um, is a little, a little older, the One Trees Project, um, which is a series of um, genetically identical trees. It's not one tree at all. It's actually originally 6,000 trees, now 100 clonal trees planted uh, throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. So. They were first exhibited together as little three-month-old plantlets. They were micropropagated from a single bunch of adventitious tissue, which is the stem cells of, of plants, and then um, planted in pairs throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. And I wanted, this is actually the handy-dandy bike map for, um, it shows you the um, phenomena. But I wanted to show you this. Um, this is two of the trees in, in Valencia and, um, and uh, 22nd in the San Francisco Bay Area. So these trees, right, the idea is that these were, they were planted over 10 years ago, um, and uh, over time they aggregate differences, genetically identical, 
the trees uh, in two per site, you can compare the difference within trees and between trees to have a display of the aggregated environmental um, differences to which these the same genes are in, um, exposed to. But this is an interesting. Um, this is these are trees are 15 feet away from each other, um, and they have the same solar exposure and. You know, they're radically different, right? Incredibly different, and one wonders why, right? <laughs> why are the trees different, which is the question it poses. And I've been going around these trees and monitoring them for a long time, but this interesting thing happened just recently. Um, I was sitting there, and the construction worker came over and asked me what was I was doing, and I explained, look, these trees have the same solar exposure, they're genetically identical, they're in the same site, they, you know, the same soil conditions. The, I had first thought it was water differences that one had got into, uh, gotten into a mains pipe, but in San Francisco they have uh, terracotta pipes in an earthquake region, so they're all cracked and, and actually they subsidize the entire urban forest um, with these leaking mains pipes everywhere. So it, that's not um, the issue. Why do they look so different? And he looked at me as if, duh. <laughs> I said, look at the, the, the houses behind which I hadn't done, and one's, the larger one, this one has a, um, has a Victorian house behind it, you know, a classic San Francisco Victorian house, and this one has a 1950s gallery behind it, actually, and uh, I said, well, okay, and he said, well, you know what happened between those two? And I said, no, <laughs> right, and the 1901 earthquake, right, okay. <laughs> And you know, he had to really step me through this, right? I've been talking to soil scientists. I've been taking wipes of the of the tree leaves to look at their particulates, um, you know, and the way that the particulates gunk up the little stomata. I've been, you know, looking at the trees, and he pointed out that, you know, because of the earthquake, foundations are built, building code is different, and foundations are different. And you know, one is effectively massive bonsai that's going on. And that the, the reason why I tell you that story is that. Um, it's the most you know, credible explanation I've had given um, all the wonderful scientists and experts that I've been talking to about understanding why these trees look different. And this construction worker, um, Troy Martinez, um, came up with a really robust explanation. And that's the power, I think, that we have, right, by doing public experiments of this sort, by drawing on the really the different views, the, the intelligent views of each one of us, that's the only way we can actually address these very complex socio-ecological questions that characterize our time, I think. Um, this project I wanted to show because we showed it, we did it um, first in, not first, but we did a, a, a version with the youngest group of people I've ever worked with um, at uh, the ARC, the Feral Robots Project. But it's also um, an, an example of the distributed intelligence of many people. What it is is a, um, we take these commercially available robotic dog toys. Uh, there's a, still about 20, 21 of them on the market currently um, that was launched by the Sony Ibo, you might recall, in 1999 and the phenomenon of entertainment robotics. Um, uh, many of these, Michael, you have, I know. Does anybody else have a robotic dog? You do. <laughs> I actually got interested in this phenomenon because someone gave me one, and I was thrilled. And then I thought, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that they wouldn't trust me with a real dog? What you know? <laughs> what's what's going on? They, I mean, they do ask this very you know this interesting question. They're toys, but they are. What are they for? Right? Toys are traditionally things we learn with, that we explore the world with, and and these present a very you know. Construction toys, you learn a bit about construction. Or, um, monopoly, you learn a lot about monopolization, right? Very useful skills. But what are these interactive toys of our time for? I mean, to interact? So it's fun to play with a porcelain doll, too, and it's fun to play with, you know, so I think there's a, there's a big cultural question there. The, the claim on interaction, which of course is a nine-month-old baby of mastered turn-taking the essential mechanics of, of interaction, I think they sort of beg the question of what could they be for? What might they be for? What, 
can we do with them? Um, and so this is the, the, what launched the Feral Robotics Project, which uh, I'll read the warning label. Um, out there in happy family homes, in offices of corporate executives, in toy stores throughout the globe, is an army of robotic dogs. These semi-autonomous robotic creatures, although currently programmed to perform inane or entertaining tasks, begging for plastic bones, barking to the tune of the national anthem, walking in circles, are actually fully motile and awaiting further instructions. So what we do in, in 11 releases, what we did is gently amputate their legs, lower their center of gravity, widen their wheelbase, give them a nose upgrade and a uh, brain surgery, and program them to follow concentration gradients of the environmental toxins they were due to, um, to release. And then we, uh, actually, I think I have, let me. Uh, so we released these packs of, of hot rotted dogs on, on various, um, uh, this is actually a Motorola site in, in Arizona. Um, and uh, um, one, a funny thing happens when, when you do that. Um, predictably, if you release hot rotted feral robots on contaminated public sites, the press will turn up. In um, San Diego, when we released it on Mission Bay, uh, we had five working robotic dogs. Um, actually, two of them broke there, so we had three. We had seven television news crews come, including Fox News. So they create a kind of mediagenic spectacle that gives us an opportunity for evidence-driven discussion, right? A 92-year-old can understand Oh, that dog is you know, appears to be sniffing something out. So we program them so they follow these concentration gradients. A two-year-old can understand what's going on. And perhaps even a television news journalist can understand <laughs> what is going on. So this idea of um, the first release here in um, the Bronx was interesting because these 15-year-olds um, who were involved in the Bronx release um, uh, have since been involved in the remediation of their um, of Starlight Park. Um, they are uh, invited to all the uh, local meetings to meet with the Con Ed engineers who are responsible for the um, the cleanup. Um, and they didn't have any expertise or any um, you know robotics training or programming training or environmental. Uh, expertise until they generated their own evidence with these dogs, right? So uh, it changes who can participate, not who can interact, but who can participate in the political processes that make our, um, our shared environmental context. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple of projects. I just wanted to actually show you this uh, solar awning uh, project which we are doing another version of shortly which um, you know awnings good technology um, for where I come from shade technology is all we talk about um, the uh, in Queensland Australia where we um, have the highest rate of melanoma in the world but, um, perhaps you're not so concerned with awnings but they um, are good for reducing heat gain in buildings but when you add photovoltaics you um, can change um, what they you know they use them to actually create um, instead of doing a twenty thousand dollar or forty thousand dollar put them on your roof a, a small solar awning allows you to explore what distributed local power production might look like so what we do is actually remove about ten percent of the uh, photovoltaic to create an aperture system these are little images of the sun that allow us to have a slow moving animation so you have an ambient display of what the um, the solar resources are this using this principle as the sun moves across it changes uh, what's displayed um, so this ambient display gives you a, a sense of the solar resources you're collecting and an opportunity to engage in a passive and sort of wondrous way with this phenomena that's generating energy. Instead of the, you know, hiding solar panels on roofs, um, your neighbor will ask you, you know, what's that? Um, it becomes a uh, culturally available and visible way of exploring what is um, uh, local power distribution might look like. And we've done a, a network of this for, um, it's an alternative to this 
idea of uh, our power generation future, where solar power plants are radically inappropriate ways of using uh, alternative energy, where, of course, if you sell your solar resources back to the grid, you lose 40% in transforming it from DC to AC, you lose about 40% in the distribution, and then you lose about 40% in transforming it back to you know, AC. So do the math, right? That doesn't quite work. Whereas exploring a lifestyle ex experience uh, of an experiment of, of setting up your own one five by five panel, solar panel can run. Does anyone know what you can run on a solar panel? Actually, my environmental engineers, my power systems engineers don't know either, right? We have a profound ignorance about uh, how to use our um, resources. Anyway, um, this idea that you can actually set one up and experience that you can actually run five of these green lights, three computers, charge um, five cell phones at the same time from one south-facing uh, solar awning gives you a concrete understanding and a capacity to engage with how we might design uh, hybrid local power production into our systems. Um, let me actually show you this project um, that takes the opportunity that the FAA has given us. And actually, the project I initiated here because of my grandfather was an aeronautical engineer who worked with Amelia Earhart and Kingsford Smith. And they took off from the beach just here next to the, um, the eye down here where the golf course is, right? Do you know what? Um, uh, and so I came here to test this system. But the FAA has created a really interesting opportunity for us in changing, creating a new class of, of um, aircraft and a new uh, pilot's license. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, the, um, the LSA or the light sport aircraft. Um, does anybody here have a pilot's license? One person does, that's good. Well, the rest of you could probably have one in, in 20 hours. So by next weekend, you could all be pilots. And this is actually what the FAA has delivered to us. This 35 of these planes are coming onto the market and, um, and a new way of thinking through. Um, what I see is an opportunity to really understand what our flight systems might look like. So does flight have to be the single most damaging thing we do as individuals, or could we rethink that. Actually, the interesting thing, when you do just a, um, a systems analysis, most of our engineering energy is spent on thrust systems and how to make planes more efficient, which they've done actually pretty well for the last 50 years, improving 1%. If cars had done that for 50 years, it'd be a lot more efficient. But um, on a commercial airline, uh, the ecological footprint, the environmental costs associated with the catering services far outweigh the the ecological footprint of the thrust systems, the fuel. And by far the biggest ongoing cost of our flight systems is the landing infrastructure, right? We build our airports almost invariably on what we used to call cheap, flat swamps, land near cities, and now we call them wetlands, biodiversity hotspots, the most critical ecosystems for sequestering CO2, and for the only technology we have for degrading whole classes of industrial contaminants and oily hydrocarbons for recharging aquifers for um, as nurseries for marine organisms, as protecting the nutrient loss from terrestrial ecosystems and the polluting of the um, wetlands are a critical ecosystem that we are constantly and always degrading. So um, in, in association, it's sort of as a, uh, if you will, an iPhone accessory to the Icon A5 that I, I showed you here, this sexy plane that um, uh, is quite lovely. Um, I developed the wet landing, which is, um, you never have to level a wet landing, right? They uh, level themselves. The, it's a private landing strip that uh, allows you to uh, reintegrate, take the opportunity that these new, uh, this new class of aircraft gives us to reintegrate um, a network of wetlands back into our urban infrastructure. So uh, to do that, you actually also have to refurnish the wetlands. So these are the heads down display and the heads way down display. And um, uh, so you can hang out. This is the heads down display. It's a very nice place to watch. Um, and actually, this is what I would call a prosthetic for the imagination. Um, for those of you who are struck by terror at the idea of your 18-year-old you know, getting a plane instead of a car, or the idea of 
you know, flying, uh, that flying might, you know, uh, for those of us who need a prosthetic for the imagination, I have these little strap-on flight simulators, if you will. So they are, um, in fact, um, actually let me, you can see here these, um, stick them out the window of a car. Um, this is squadron training and um, <laughs> the, the angle of attack, the maneuverability, that, um, that wonder of flight, exploring the phenomena of lift, that fluid regime that um, is so compelling that keeps us looking at the birds and studying them. They, uh, you can again play with that. And I would argue and do argue uh, that, this, that the actual pilot skill transferable from this experience compared to the skill from a flight simulator on your you know, computer or video based flight simulator is, is actually much more transferable to, actu uh, to real pilot skill. Um, you can also, there's a strap-on black box, your iPhone, you can put that out the window of the car too and map your three-axis acceleration changes and upload load your fl flight log. But this is all to kind of re-explore, to uh, uh, reclaim flight as um, an area of wonder and play and real. Um, so once you've done that, once you've actually um, you know, earned your wings, you can then strap on a 16-foot wingspan by a mimetic wing um, and um, fly. Um, uh, practice your wet landings, which is... I, let me actually pull up a little um, video of that because I thought I had done that. Um, that might take a little bit to... So we've... Um, been flying people recently, um, and in actually Toronto in October last year, we flew hundreds of people through downtown Toronto, past City Hall, across Nathan Phillips Square, wearing these um, wings. Of course, they had to go to flight school first, and their safety uh, thing. This is their autopilot license that you earn. Of course, you sign your own autopilot license. Uh, you have to do a written test and answer questions like, you know, why do plane wings look so different from bird wings? and what is the future of urban mobility. Um, uh, but then you strap on, and uh, I actually show you here evidence. There was a whole lot of grandmothers that um, <laughs> took to flight in this context. Um, and uh, this is actually some video of the, the um, spectacle. As you came out from, I'm sorry, I turned that sound off. As you came out from flight school, you got to play with a, a real sized, simulator and feel and maneuver the wings because these zip lines these zip lines are not about speed and height and terror but about that gentle phenomena of lift and about exploring radically different ideas for what urban mobility could be or might be so even though we weren't allowed to fly children in this context there was many children in the, con in the, um, in the um, they sort of got as a consolation prize and a hand flyer. Um, but what the strategy of this is to produce a, um, obviously a spectacle uh, that I would argue is a shared public memory of a possible future. And that's intervention with what um, our urban mobility future might look like if we could fly, um, I think is, um, was gratified by the formation of, a, of a, a group of kids who have decided they're going to zip line to school and who have made all the arguments on my behalf of, you know, f radically inexpensive public transportation, fast, emissionless and safe form of urban mobility, right, that also allows them to fly, allows them to explore the wonder of flight, to rethink, to go beyond the bike lane in transforming our urban mobility. Um, so these, um, I think, imaginative embodied experiences that really create possibilities concretely are um, what this strategy is about. I'm currently looking to do a zip line in Long Island City. Um, and that is actually, as part of the urban plan I briefly mentioned, um, that uh, 
I was invited to develop for a chunk of New York City, which is a pretty interesting chunk. Long Island City is essentially the only part of manufacturing left in New York City, um, and it faces Manhattan, arguably one of the most charismatic skylines in the world, but you can't see it from anywhere because of the zoning height limits, because of the other issues. So we've, um, by fiat, when you're doing an urban plan, you can decide to upgrade all the elevators. So in conspiracy with uh, Otis, the elevator company, the dominant elevator company in the US, um, I've developed these upgraded elevators um, that actually go 30% higher than the building itself, right? You can see here, we take the building and then we do a 30% extension. So you actually go up the elevator ride and it produces the view of Long Island City. So when you do that, actually, you, um, um, you create a greenhouse, a glass box is effectively on the top of a building is a greenhouse, right? The greenhouse effect, you know, it'll heat up. That, in fact, pulls, uh, you vent that, that, of course, releases air um, and you pull air passively through the building using the shaft effect, which is uh, an old tradition of architecture that um, uh, we've abandoned because a fire code has required us to isolate shafts so that fires don't propagate up the, um, the shaft. But with um, you know, active switches where in the event of fire, the, sh the elevator shaft isolates, you can um, then use that. So uh, the 30% head is in order to get the, the, um, the enough passive circulation to replace an HVAC system. And in Manhattan, about 80% of the CO2 is produced by buildings and largely by their, their um, freight systems. So then uh, by using the uh, generative braking, you actually, actually get a, a, a smoother drop. Um, so you can capture more energy on the way down. Um, the, the elevators, uh, these Gen 2 elevators are already 75% more efficient, but now we can change the balance to actually make the elevators a little power plant in the building itself that also replaces the HVAC system and gives you access to the roof where you can then, of course, instead of distributing uh, in Long Island City, there's 25 commercial bakeries, one of which is Tomcat Bakery, for instance, that delivers um, 76 trucks every morning delivers fresh, airy, artisanal bread all over New York City and plumes of diesel fumes to Long Island City residents in an area we call Asthma Alley, right? So we, we typically, that's how we distribute our food, by degrading the cardiovascular health of each one of us and causing asthma in our children. Uh, should we? <laughs> or could we actually, um, in this case, uh, Tomcat Bakery and Fresh Direct, which is the online grocery store, 7,000 deliveries a day around New York City, 7,000 deliveries worth of diesel fumes concentrated in uh, Long Island City. They are three blocks and two blocks respectively from the um, water, which is, of course, the raison d'etre of New York City, the efficient um, mobility that water-based transportation uh, gives us. And so then we can start to think about how we would distribute goods um, in these inexpensive ways to uh, down to the water and over. This is Randall Island over here um, and New York City where uh, zip lining and exploring uh, the radical efficiencies that may seem improbable at first, but I can tell you the people who have flown the zip lines, um, and actually let me show you these other zip lines. This is the from the San Jose Biennial. Um, the a smaller version, modest version, of the um, uh, there is a let me take you here. Um, you know, any one of you can build a wet landing here. Um, this is perfect for your local parking lot. Trinity College, I think, could have one to go from one side of the campus to the other. The science gallery would have a nice launch from up here. But these. Um, uh, possibilities of really using the wonder of flight and a thrilling and compelling experience um, as urban mobility is something that needs to be infused into our um, collective imagination and our possible futures. So towards that end, how do we actually materially change things? Um, 
And uh, we recently launched an exercise program, which is personal training um, that we develop for anyone um, interested in building up their deltoids or getting that six pack or improving their environmental, you know, improving their own personal health. But in addition to improving your health, these, this exercise program also improves the environmental health um, after the Aristotelian idea of changing our habitats, we have agency to change what it is we do ourselves. So your exercise program, this is the ex one of our inpatient exercise programs around Long Island City, and one of the exercises which is, uh, is hula hooping, very good for core body conditioning for that six pack, but our hula hoops are adapted with um, a selection of northeastern wildflowers. So as you hula hoop in your little area, you're distributing perennial resources for critical pollinators and re-engaging um, with them. Uh, and of course, you're much more likely to go back and check next week on your six-week challenge to see what's sprouted, what's happened, uh, and the incentives of actually materially seeing, contributing to transforming the environment uh, part of that. So that exercise program um, has been augmented by a series of other sports. Uh, Michael John mentioned the Bronx Ooze project, which is um, not at all constrained to the Bronx, which is the northern borough of New York City, but um, here we actually go down into Manhattan. Everywhere, sort of the idea that we keep our non-humans in little boxes that we call parks, I think we have to get beyond that idea and understand we're cohabiting with them. That's why Decentral Park is, is named such. But um, one of the other sports that's been developed in this kind of rediscovering the sport in transport, if you will. Um, one of the other sports is this one. Does anybody know who the strongest animal in the world is? Any guesses? Sorry, no guesses? I can't hear them. Ants? Most people think ants, but um, actually it appears in every biome in the world. It's a, it's a hero of the underworld. It's uh, the rhinoceros beetle, or the stag beetle, as you call it here. Um, uh, and um, interfacing with rhinoceros beetles, kind of re-exploring their... Uh, how do you interface with uh, these? You know, I call them the caterpillars of the underworld, if you will. If cater you know, caterpillars, the yellow heavy lifting equipment, right? Because they're extraordinary, biomechanically impossible strengths, right? They're uh, several fold stronger than ants, um, a whole order of magnitude stronger. I mean, they're biomechanically impossible because they aerate, they churn the soil, they create biodiversity in the soil, which of course is the critical skin on which we all depend. So um, this is the rhinoceros beetle wrestling sport that um, I actually have people, you can see here, uh, it's a head-mounted display, VR display, if you will, that scales mechanically and visually the um, human scale to beetle scale and beetle scale to human scale so that you can have a level playing field, if you will, and challenge the rhinoceros beetle. So um, uh, this is actually quite a violent sport. It's scored um, sort of like wrestling. And uh, I take wages on man versus beast, which is actually how I fund this project. So anyone who'd like to... I, t I like to challenge sort of icons of masculinity, museum directors like Michael John, <laughs> to, uh, to wrestle the rhinoceros beetle. Um, and I also offer... Um, scholarships to my program at NYU to, in order to encourage a varsity sport of rhinoceros beetle wrestling. So you might and get the idea that if you have rhinoceros beetle wrestling in high schools, right, you'd have to have rhinoceros beetles. And invariably the rhinoceros beetles will get out and perhaps start churning up that toxic turf that we use as our sports fields and return some biodiversity to um, so I'll just finish off with a couple more projects um, that are um, uh, current. Um, I've recently launched the pharmacy project, and the person who asked the best question, I'm going to give you one of the things that um, this is based on, which is the ag bag. And this was co-designed with Kat, who, um, Kat Kramer, who was one of the designers of the edible exhibition. Um, the ag bag system 
uh, well, just let me say, the pharmacy project is really to take the idea of farming or urban farming, as the name would suggest, and say, well, could we do it in a way that it doesn't just reduce the negative damage of, you know, reduce the food miles, reduce the pesticide use, reduce the uh, fertilizer, reduce the negative damage of our food and agriculture systems? And could we design a system that actually improves environmental health, that augments biodiversity, that actually um, produces, uh, improves air quality? And I argue we can, and this, the first part of this is this ag bag, which is a simple Tyvek based growing system, these bags that can turn any railing or window ledge or parapet into arable territory, right, out of thin air. So Tyvek you'd be familiar with from your FedEx envelopes and from your rave bands when you go into concerts, right? It's inc the tensile strength is amazing, but you probably what you don't know is that it, uh, it's a synthetic felt, and so it has these micropores, and it breathes. So the oxygen exchange, it's waterproof, but it breathes, which means that um, the rhizomic sphere, that where roots are active and oxygenated, are all around that bag, right? It's not just the layer at the top. Um, and inside we have, um, you know, you would ask quite correctly, well, where does it drain to? How does it drain? And I would say that this is actually a closed system, closed system agriculture, i.e. there isn't runoff. Even if you're in the nicest, sweetest organic farms, you know, you, you have runoff, right? And that's a tremendous cost of, um, and ongoing incremental degradation of our soil resources, but we can do closed system agriculture um, by actually having micro reservoirs within the, the um, soil. So these are polyacrylamide, the stuff you have in, in diapers or your contact lenses, right? It uh, holds water or you've probably got them in, uh, they expand dinosaurs and things, you put in water and they expand 300 times their size, right, that, that uh, polyacrylamide gel. So we put that in the soil and that acts as micro-reservoirs that kind of drains the, the water out of the soil and then re-releases it back when the osmotic pressure is sufficient to release it back. So we have a water-conserving, closed system agriculture, intensified system that you can um, turn your railing or windowsill into um, an urban farm, a U farm. And then of course the question is, actually this is a facade we did at, at, in Chelsea in the um, Postmasters Gallery. Um, and you can see here that they, we actually had a berry farm. The idea of the, um, you know, there's one technology that we have in, uh, at our disposal to improve air quality. And only one demonstrated technology for improving air quality in urban context. Does anyone know what it is? Trees, yeah, but leaf area index more specifically. It's the leaves. Um, and so what we um, do here is choose a repertoire of plants that um, have a high shoot to root ratio. That is, um, in this facade, we had berry plants, tay berries, which are a cross between a raspberry and a, and a blackberry and taste neither like a raspberry nor a blackberry. Um, and uh, these tay berries produce about seven foot of, of foliage per growing season. They live at about 25 years and about 30 pounds of berries per, per stalk. Right? So that's about 76 trees worth of, of leaf area index on this uh, facade with a very small root mass and much less infrastructure cost. Um, so it's a demonstration of how we can measurably improve air quality and produce delicious edibles. Um, but, you know, the question is, um, of course, this can be, it's radically inexpensive, which is why I can give one to you know, the, the best question tonight. Um, and, uh, and we're exploiting the durability of Tyvek, right? That, that's the thing that constitutes the Pacific gear, right? The, the trash plastic island in the middle of the Pacific um, is largely HDP, high density polyethylene, that's incredibly resistant to biodegrading, can survive decades in the marine environment, but in this context where we can exploit its durability. And also the fact that we paint these bags white, um, and so they have titanium dioxide on them, which is a photocatalyst, which breaks down noxes and soxes and um, uh, potent carcinogens in order to further improve air quality. But the question, I think, is what to grow. Um, and um, anybody, what, what would define an urban food? Any ideas about 
what would be because after all the big critique of of urban foods is you know yield what can you possibly get in you know you don't have access to any soil really well we do have access to a lot of vertical space um, and structurally we put them on railings and windowsills where it's not roofs right where roofs are you can support about an inch and a half of soil on on uh, you know a, a code roof right you can't grow a carrot in in that um, but so here we can actually support tremendous weight um, uh, because the compressive loading of masonry walls, right? Effectively, you can put anything on them. So we've got a lot of vertical space, but really significant yield. And, and why not just in, invest in the struggling rural communities, right? Seven miles up the Hudson, in the case of New York City, that are selling out family farms because they can't, they can't get into the, um, the markets and it's better to sell out to fracking, hydrofracking um, in terms of... Anyway, so these are the critiques of, of urban farming, which you know, then what makes a viable urban food? And I would argue these are high nutrition value, high commercial value, highly perishable, non-distributable goods. So any ideas of what that might be? Berries. Berries. Tomatoes, you're competing with uh, rural agriculture and... and uh, uh, Sorry? Salads, microgreens, they're not really neither high nutrition. Well, they, there's some uh, pets. pets. <laughs> <laughs> flowers, I, I would argue. And flowers are the um, signal, potent, you know, they're high color, potent lycopenes, powerful antioxidants, a whole range of powerful antioxidants that shift us from a kind of cal caloric based of, uh, idea of food to a nutrition based idea of food, right, that we need these potent uh, and novel, these black pansies, um, the blackest pansies ever grown, actually, a viola. Um, you pick them and you, within about five minutes you have to use them, otherwise all the uh, delicate volatiles kind of are gone. But if you flash and fuse them into vodka and um, within a couple of minutes you get the most incredible vodka, I have to say. Um, so these ideas of high nutrition value, high commercial value, highly perishable, non-distributable goods start to make um, urban agriculture much more viable. Um, and that distributed intelligence that I was talking about, this is actually this, the calendrical system. When things bloom is, a, is the most sensitive indicator we have of you know, a massive computational algorithm that all these plants perform to decide when to bloom, right? And that's the phenology is our best indicator of climate destabilization. So um, on these bags, we, um, the, uh, the ewe farmer, this is Doni, who's one of the ewe farmers. She's um, happily growing and hosting um, an ag bag um, she'd never farmed before. And now she's the most avid uh, you farmer you'd ever come across. But what we do is we mark when things bloom, right? So that's, a, that's January through December. Um, and so when the pansies leaf uh, a blossom, she marked through there. Whenever an insect visits or a bird visits, she marks it on there. So we actually break that nature culture divide of, of plants being outside of uh, nature. We draw right with them. In fact, I put all my Google Calendar dates on mine um, and all my grant uh, deadlines on my um, my calendar here. It's much better than Google Calendar, in fact. For for it's much more pleasant and the intimate relationship that we are, you know, materially part of these um, cyclical systems is is realised in this in this context. So um, the other strategy I would argue is um, uh, I just I want to ask you the question. Uh, you know, most of the world's food is still produced by small lot farmers who have traditions of intensification that, uh, you know, largely you, you graze your meat, milk or fibre animal in, you share your, your grain and vegetables with your, your animals, right? Um, and then they poop in the right place, right? If you don't have a tractor to shift around manure and uh, you actually have to, you know, be a little bit more strategic with your caloric expenditure. So they... So what would be the urban animal, meat animal, that uh, you might, you know, that can graze vertically? 
Birds don't have much flesh on them, but um, snails. Snails are the... Um, they are, of course, so incredibly um, great uh, at indicating soil quality. And, um, and in this context here, um, where we have a snail superhighway, the rain guide between the... Um, they have a little RFID tag, super glues on very nicely onto their shell, and you put an RFID reader on that goes just the right speed for an RFID reader, and then you can send snail mail up to your... your um, and in fact, what we do is we... Um, have snail races where, you know, at the beginning of the growing season, we set the snails off and, and then see which one goes further, right? Uh, we have, uh, you can put bets on, on the snails. And of course, that then is the synthetic evolution problem of do you eat the fast, you know, brawny snails that get to the top first or the slow, kind of languid, you know, luscious snails? Um, these are, are problems that we um, have to face when you... These are some snail training um, videos. Um. But um, I think perhaps the snail milking... Snail milk is the most... Um, the most... Uh, high value... If anyone wants to learn how to milk a snail, um, come to me afterwards, but uh, it is a, the snail slime, which snails produce you know, in, in the presence of radiation um, and is a, a very high value component uh, ingredient in, in high-end face creams and in medical applications to promote healing. There's over 200 um, uh, proteins in snail slime that make it a very potent form of uh, and the highest value product, which makes urban agriculture viable. Um, so um, let me show you a couple of other things just to relate to non-humans, and I'm finishing off with some of the tasties. Um, this is a project called Amphibious Architecture, which is an interface to, to fish. As you can see, it's a series of buoys that light up as a fish swims underneath. Um, and uh, this is deployed in the East River. We also did it in the Bronx River. Um, and you can see here that the buoys, as they're deployed, have an always-on light at the top, which shows you water quality, and, a, um, and then the light that turns on when fish um, swim underneath. And so the first question people ask is, are there fish in the East River? And uh, yes, <laughs> there are fish in the East River. I can, I sh and I'll show you um, that you can see here. Note the lights are blue. There's a fish at the front, going across the front, going down the side. There. So yes, there are fish in the East River. Um, so not only can you know that they're there, you can also then text the fish and they text you back. Um, there was actually over um, 700 subscribers to... Uh, down on the sites, there was business cards of the organisms that you were likely to see there, so, and their contact details. That's how you got to text them. And then you could subscribe to the you know, daily or weekly updates. And the most popular um, organism was the beaver. Um, so you texted him, yo, beaver, and he would um, text you back you know, whenever he went by the array. Um, and he was kind of a sleazy character, like two million other desperate single males in New York City. He was actually, he was the first beaver to settle in New York City uh, in 200 years. And so he was always inviting people over for, you know, to his, come and see my lodge and let's go for a cross-species adventure, right? He, um, uh, but he now has a, um, uh, a friend, he's now um, well known to be a homosexual beaver, um, and Jose, the, the, the original one is Jose B the Beaver, but Justin Beaver has moved in. <laughs> and um, uh, so there, um, I can translate for these um, organisms, but um, they, you know, they, how to interact with them, how to uh, understand their presence and what they're doing. Um, of course, the next thing that happens, and this is what spawned the Cross Species Adventure Club that we will be doing as a dinner of tomorrow night, which is a molecular gastronomy supper club that explores food and food systems that improve environmental health. Um, we've had um, many of them now. Um, supper clubs are, well, 
they are illegal. <laughs> There's no, they are illegal um, because you know you don't have the restaurant code and whatever. Um, so we ask you to uh, we give that these invitations where you know, we ask you to scan them, you know, identify the camouflage QR code and um, and then read them, of course, but also ingest them um, because um, uh, you know and these are printed on. Um, rice paper, which explores the why do we use these durable materials for ephemeral purposes? We might um, invent that. This is the lures, which is what was developed to feed the fish instead of you know all that uh, those signs at every city park: do not feed the animals. Why not feed the animals? You know, why should we monopolise the nutritional resources? And at the amphibious architecture array to um, instead of feeding them cigarette butts or Doritos or chewing gum, whatever you have in your pocket, um, right? Um, we've developed these lures which are um, cast into commercial fishing. Uh, they're an, uh, a gelin, which is an algae derivative. So they're nutritionally appropriate for the fish as opposed to Doritos, right? Um, and they, um, they also, you can imagine a school bus full of kids uh, offering these lures. Um, they um, you know, the fish, the feedback system works. The fish learn when the lights go on, food is likely to appear, and people learn when the lights go on, fish are likely to be there. So we get a feedback loop, um, quite literally. And they also have in them a, um, a chelating agent um, derived from chitin. It's a medical grade chelating agent that if you have lead poisoning or mercury poisoning, you're likely to get in the case of. Um, and so that when the fish ingest them, it binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals and PCBs. Um, and complexes and passes out in a less reactive form where it settles into the silt and is effectively removed from bioavailability. So what I want you to elaborate there is that when you have many people uh, feeding the fish, instead of this idea of environmental work being about you know, turning off the light and using less pesticides and using less gas and uh, you know, what you can't do, you know, or what you can do less of to doing, to really focusing on what you can do and how these small interactions with the fish can aggregate into larger remediative effect, you, you know, resupply, re, um, augmenting the nutritional resources and actually reducing the pollutant burden that's bioaccumulated in the fish. So it's very different from the approach that traditional environmental engineering uses, which is currently in the Hudson River, the biggest Superfund site in the country. They have dredges dredging up, after 30 years of legislative wrangling, dredging up the PCBs um, that have been covered by you know, a seven centimetre layer of silt resuspending all of that and taking that toxic sludge off to Pennsylvania or the nearest third world country who will take that toxic sludge, where of course it continues to be toxic sludge. So this displacement idea that we have of dealing with our environmental issues, you know, that we take indoor air and we flush it out with outdoor air, you know, on the presumption that outdoor air quality is better than indoor air quality which is largely not true. So we have a lot of systems built in where we are displacing our environmental issues and rather than dealing with them. And I want to show you this one as an example of dealing with them. Just a couple more things to kind of wet your palate and finish off. Murkish Delight is um, a taste of wet landings. This is a sphere that will explode in your mouth and introduce you to the wonders of wetlands. Um, Viva Levitum and Wet Kisses, the marshmallow for kissing a frog formerly known as Prince is a edible cocktail that contains, uh, it's a vegan marshmallow to rediscover the marsh in marshmallow and to, in fact, have cognac and lime juice and Turkish pepper, but also violosian. Purple comes from violosian, which is a potent antifungal produced by this soil bacteria called levitum that when it's on the microbial community on the, on the skin of frogs, they survive the deadly chytrid fungus, which is the biggest culprit in the massive species extinction crisis, the biggest since the dinosaurs that we're currently spectators to. So as you bite into this cocktail, your lips are inoculated with J. levitum and violosian, and that equips you to kiss a frog and protect it from the deadly chytrid fungus. Um, there's many more of these 
delectable um, uh, devices. Um, uh, this is the Salamander Superhighway, which I'll tell you about. But I wanted to finish off. The Butterfly Bridge goes on up um, next week in, the, um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I wanted to finish off with an invitation to, um, to explore and use um, the tree office, which is an office in a tree, not a tree house. But uh, in Long Island City, where the exhibition is, I've deemed that all the trees own themselves and the property they stand on. Um, so uh, in order to exploit those property, that ownership structure, um, we've built a tree office. So your landlord is a tree. It's a co-working space with Wi-Fi and, um, and local power production. And anyone who's coming to New York for the summer can book office time there. You have the best views of New York City. Um, and you can come and explore how we might reimagine, reuse, rethink our natural systems, our urban natural systems, how we might experiment with them and use our own agency, our own lifestyles as a medium for experimentation and explore a tasty and biodiverse future. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, where do we start? Wow. Um, <laughs> the, I suppose uh, we started with science and, and with uh, what science is for. And um, I'm always struck by the way your work uh, plays at the, at the edges of science and uh, also plays at the edges of product development and uh, business and uh, um, so many of the projects, you're, you're just struck by the idea, oh, that's going to produce a, an incredible data which will be really valuable for, for science, or, you know, that's, what a great product, you know, that, that's uh, going to be uh, a fantastic uh, investment opportunity. Um, do you ever run into challenges in, when people misunderstand the category in which your work falls, or when they think it, you know, this is science rather than art, or this is business rather than artistic practice. Does that boundary, uh, is that somewhere you, you like to inhabit? Or I suppose you, you must, because you, you live in it. But it, it, what, what happens when people misunderstand it? Well, I think that's actually an, the kind of the, the more blatant way that people ask me that question is, how do you fund this stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> what, well, uh, yeah. what do you find, <laughs> which is, yeah. um, you know, is where the rubber hits the ground of, um, or the road, as the saying goes, to, you know, making people understanding, enlist, enlisting people into making this happen. And I suppose that's the difficulty, um, because of course, the National Science Foundation doesn't really fund design. And the, particularly in the US, design is very much in the service structure of the IDOs and the big design companies that there's so that's there's no there's no design funding and experimental design is of the sort that I do is really not even in the kind of vocabulary of funding agencies at all and so largely it uh, I work and have to I think an interesting discipline of figuring out how to enlist the kind of micro investments of not only money but people's interest and collaboration in making this stuff happen because it's it's largely not paid for right or so the small arts budgets to you know to mount the bridge and the infrastructure for the the Butterfly Bridge, which you can see is the same Tyvek system that allows these critical pollinators to cross the ur urban obstacles that, you know, smash them um, mostly as they try to navigate our arterial roads. Um, to put up bridges across roads is, um, and to actually make that work, the discipline of um, it being largely unfunded and certainly not with the blessing of the Department of Transportation. Actually, signage companies are the ways to go. And, and I didn't actually, the, the, the reason why that facade doesn't look like a, 
it's very mature is because it was, it was um, taken down. I was issued a class one violation for the, the ag bag facade that on, in Chelsea, which is what they give to construction companies for killing people. Right? Um, so, uh, and I had to go to Department of Buildings Court to justify why I had done this without a permit. And the permit, um, you know, I, I said, well, you know, there wasn't really a permit to use and facade work doesn't require permit and trellises don't require permit and, you know, and they said, okay, well, and they gave me the fine and, and then I asked them, well, what permit should I use? And they said, well, there isn't one. <laughs> so then I have to, you know, find the closest one, which turns out to be um, signage and advertising, right? Um, so the next set of ag bags are going up in Long Island City as advertising. Not sure what they're advertising, but they, they're going out as advertising. So it's strategies for finding opportunities that, of course, creating opportunities that don't exist, but are a real kind of bureaucratic battle to create novel instances to explore possibilities. I mean, and I, I suppose that's most of the work is this area, people are misunderstanding the category or not having a category for ag bags or butterfly bridges or uh, infrastructure for non-humans or as then developing something that is similar enough to allow us to kind of scaffold onto that a, uh, you know. There, there is this Japanese word, uh, chindogu, you know, for mm -hmm. these useless but poetic objects uh, which, uh, you know, tr trigger, trigger a particular way of thinking and, and but don't necessarily have any uh, function. Uh, is that uh, something that you uh, are familiar with? Tony Dunn, the, the right. uh, uh, critical designer, uh, sometimes cites that as a, you know, a stimulus for this sort of critical design thinking, but would you situate your work in that sphere? Or no, I wouldn't slightly? actually. I right. mean, I, yeah. I understand and I, uh, and I, the value of design for debate or design yeah. for, um, uh, is, you know, is certainly um, there, but I'm a little more earnest and mm. I really do make the kind of truth claims that, mm. um, you know, uh, scientists like to make. It's uh, butterfly bridges to connect habitat patches and facilitate, uh, you know, I want every city to be able to develop a tradition of putting up, you know, if you put up Christmas banners, you can just in spring put up these low growth butterfly attractors that guide, bounce butterflies and pollinators across safely as, you know, not just for a debate, not just for an idea, yeah. but for a for an earnest um, infrastructural mm. uh, upgrade to, a, you know, to recognize the fact, or the Salamander Superhighway, which is just a little underpass mm. for, as opposed to an overpass, where as you drive across, it's kind of a micro speed bump, so you get the little reminder that we're not alone. And then as they go through, they tweet, um, you know, because they, uh, it's a little, things that they say, hi, honey, I'm coming home, right? Yeah. So you get a reminder and a voice, but these are legitimate ways to, to inexpensively re, you know, hack our urban systems mm -hmm. to accommodate these critical organisms that, you know, on which our own health depends. So I have, it's sort of like using spectacle and um, engagement in similar ways, but, um, but I'm sort of, I think boringly earnest in that I do want to see butterfly bridges and salamander superhighways and um, snail crossings to in our you know biodiverse complex urban ecosystems. I don't want it just as an idea and the struggle to make it to get it beyond the idea and into the language of the public agencies is um, is a hard one. Great. Well, I'd love to open it up to the audience now, um, and I, I hope we'll have some questions. I just uh, before I do that, though, so just to clarify, um, so you would like to see these projects sc reaching scale? I suppose it's not just about uh, you know mediagenic projects and so on. That's part of it, but I suppose there is a, a real goal to to achieve scale in these projects and have them in, replicated around the world. Would that be fair to say? 
I would like to see that. I think yeah. it's a, I think that's a hard design challenge that I, it's yeah. it's certainly and certainly the environmental health clinic as a context mm. is a way to facilitate that. So mm. I students who work with me and and you know as a legitimate recognizable institutional context. People know how to use a clinic. They know they can ring up and make a phone call, yeah. right, and say, can I have an appointment? You know, they don't really know what they might talk about, but they can come in and do that. And then be enlisted into co-producing mm. something in yeah. their context, even though there isn't, you know, funding, even there, there isn't, um, you know, the traditional, there's no agency to make this happen. But there is, I think, the, eagerness and willingness of many creative individuals who want to hack the city, who want to make, who want to explore differences. And I think by producing a space in very different places where a designer can, instead of going to work for a design firm or, a, um, you know, do it for the money, if you will, the prostitution model of, of design or experimental design, where uh, you can actually hang up a little you know, shingle and say, I'm an environmental health clinician and, and we'll figure out how to improve our shared environmental health as a design challenge. So I think that's one of the ways that I'm looking at how to scale and aggregate, um, you know, the inexpensive pharmacy project, the pharmacy co-ops as well, it depends on people using their own windowsills and the micro-investment of putting the soil in and coordinating the planting so it's not just flower boxes and gardening, but, you know, so you can, if you coordinate the planting and the products, you can then sell the products. And so Fresh Direct is interested in buying anything that our Long Island City Co-op can sell because they like the story. And so that's a little co-op that, you know, really can and might develop only by the, the credibility of people wanting to play with it, wanting to explore and wanting to adapt or do something similar, but you know, aggregate with it. So that's, I suppose, the scaling strategy or the ambition. Great, thanks. So do we have questions in the audience? Yeah, one right down here at the front. I think we have microphones, so if you wouldn't mind just waiting until the microphone arrives. Uh, thanks, Louise. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Giulio, and I have a question. I, I'm Italian. And so I, I love cooking. And my question is, do you have any courses for cooking uh, those stuff that you presented? And particularly, I'm interested in bird's food because I used to give the, you know, bread crumb to birds, well, what is less over when I cut it, but uh, trying to melt this with uh, the possibility to help the environment will be a great opportunity. So I'm joking, but not really joking. I'm, so in the I'm opportunity not to. <laughs> yes. um, I actually did. Um, I've done a lot of bird food. Actually, the, the first version was, and what got me into this with the bird food bars was just taking health food bars and relabeling the nutrition facts for birds, right? As opposed to for people to look at the, you know, the shared nutritional resources that, in fact. We eat the same stuff. We, you know, live in the same system. We depend on the same stuff. So, so in that case, it was originally just rethinking human food and how to recirculate it, and share it. But it's since developed, and there's a wonderful chef at Dill Restaurant in in Iceland who has developed um, a uh, a brittle with a series of seeds that, when you share it with the birds, it also propagates the marshland plants that. Um, further enhance. Instead of feeding them white bread, which is in Iceland, the, the Reykjavik Tjorn, the, the major lake in the middle of the city, is the biggest pollution burden is white bread that, you know, every kid, go, every toddler goes down there and feeds the ducks, with, you know. And so that's actually, um, that and the roadborne pollution is, you know, what has uh, eutrophied this entire system and so um, he's a wonderful um, molecular gastronomy informed chef that I work with. So I've been doing, the supper club has allowed me to work with um, uh, a number of um, really wonderful chefs to develop this. And this, this realm of molecular gastronomy that, um, uh, that's recently been codified in, the, in a massive book called Modernist Cuisine um, 
that has a kind of form, you know, in, instructions for this kind of food. And really the work of taking, using scientific description to, to talk about the transformations that happen in the kitchen. Um, I use it in a very different way. I use it to that the descriptions of the materials and the stuff that we're developing, like the isomalt that pastry chefs use, um, which is, they use it for the optical clarity and because you can more precisely control the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the stabilization of it. And, uh, but I use it for a, a cotton candy called floss, which the edible flowers um, we put inside a, a cotton candy, what they call it, cotton floss, candy, candy floss. floss, candy floss. In Australia, you call it cotton and fairy floss. And in the, and the US, it's cotton candy and candy floss. So it's a nice little, uh, anyway, um, I call it floss after the free Libra open source systems movement um, because we have a little USB powered um, uh, cotton candy maker. Um, that we use isomalt, which is a sugar alcohol that when you ingest it, diabetics use it for, because it doesn't give you that GI spike. Um, and and your competitive pastry chefs use it for its optical clarity. But I use it because it actually, um, it's digested in the, your lower gut um, uh, rather than, you know, in the higher gut. And so you're effectively farming your lower gut, fostering biodiversity in your lower gut, um, which is a good thing to do. And so wrapped around edible flowers with an LED in the middle and dusted with bee pollen, it becomes a very um, festive, um, carnivalesque food that starts to explore these you know, new possibilities of creating the kinds of foods that we want to share with birds or to produce environmental health. And I think, yes, you know, the Cross Species Adventure Club um, is uh, open to members, and you are officially now invited to be a member. <laughs> it's Many members, Natalie. Huh? We, I do have uh, everyone who comes to one of these suppers becomes a human member. members are mostly non human. Mostly uh, non human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always non humans at it, but it's for adventurous eaters of any species, mm. and, um, and it's a great place. We always do workshops. But we are ma mainly explore with our tongues, tongue first explorations. Um, yeah, I should mention actually, Natalie did invite me, as she mentioned, to wrestle the rhinoceros beetle. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I was ready, ready to wrestle it, uh, the whole headgear and everything, uh, but uh, the beetle didn't show up. So, uh, <laughs> yes. you know. So anyway, <laughs> uh, more questions or comments or ideas? Yes. Back at the back there, just to maybe. Could you bring a microphone to the person at the back? Um, what was your inspiration, or, or what was, or who was your inspiration for this whole thing? For the for this whole project, kind for of. For this whole project. For everything. <laughs> for everything. How did you begin? What was your spark? Like. That's such a hard question. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't, you know, I, I think that um, I'm a techno fetishist, right? I like technology, like many of us. I have an unhealthy relationship to technology, but the way I rationalise that um, is by thinking it, thinking about my fascination with new technologies as. Okay, it's unhealthy, but um, but it, but I think about it as an opportunity for exploring what kind of social and environmental change that these new technologies provide. And so I think every time a new technology comes out, virtual reality, I think, of course, we have to rhinoceros beetle wrestle or molecular gastronomy. Of course, we have to think about how we can use that for really, I think the biggest challenges we face in the 21st century, uh, you know, our reinventing our food systems, hacking our food systems. I would call that the space race of the 21st century that requires each of us to rethink our habits, our habitats, our ways of eating, 
um, and certainly my own. So I think, um, I don't know how to answer that question, but I think it's, it's question driven. Of, you know, what could we do about urban mobility? Why do we, we deal with this kind of you know, roadkill and human kill associated with, uh, why, why is that okay to lose hundreds of thousands of people and, you know, because of the way we, uh, you know, it's horrible, right? Why could we do something about it? So it starts with questions. Do you, do you think flying is going to be a lot safer, like personal flight? I actually do. <laughs> and the FAA is with me. I mean, the FAA has designed this new class um, specifically with these ballistic parachutes, right? So the planes can't fall out of the sky. They actually have an airbag, if you will, that they, uh, if when you go into stall, it detonates this, this parachute that gently plops you down. And, and it's 3D space up there, right? So it's actually harder to run into someone than, than in, a, in a car, right? Um, cars are, are deadly, but, but also um, the, yeah, the idea that we've, um, the, I, th I think the reference point of M Amelia he Earhart, there's an inspiration because Amelia Earhart was, uh, she, she was around at a time when planes, flight was about possibility, right? It was about exploration. It was about, um, you know, it was the internet of the time. There would be no more wars because you could just fly over and talk to someone, right? It, you know, we wouldn't have um, massive world wars. And that was just before the massive world wars where flight became militarized as a way to dominate. And But, but she was exploring flight for uh, this new technology for exploration, for wonder, for um, to see what we could do with it, and and I think that's that's m my attitude to new technologies of um, you know how can we use an iPhone app as a as a black box you know outside the the car phone. So I think that's um, that's an uh, the the theme song is what opportunity do new technologies provide for environmental and social change? Other questions? Yeah, one here at the front. Yeah. Like we should. Just down at the front here, yeah. Oh, wow, that was fast. <laughs> um, kind of building on what you just said, Natalie, um, I just wanted to know how important communication was to you and the work that you do, and you can take that word and expand it whatever way you want, communication, telecommunications. Um, I'd just be interested to know, uh, is it something that you think about in the projects that you do, or is it a fundamental part of what you do? Communication and translation, yeah, I think is, um, is fundamental. Fundamentally, um, and the, the project that we um, Michael John and I worked on together the um, the robotic geese was actually a quite a literal idea that um, by driving around these robotic you know avatars these geese and ducks and interacting with real geese we could actually learn duck or learn goose right that you actually how do you learn languages you don't learn it from a dictionary where you look up a word right you're 50,000 words you learned from interaction attempts, right? Just figuring out what is meaningful. And, and what was really great about this um, Stevens Green release is the kids that were <laughs> just um, wild explorers with these robotic ducks. You know, to have them go slow or sort of not, t not frighten the ducks was like, you kidding me? <laughs> and they were going. And the, the idea is there was one little lame duck that was um, friends with a seagull, and they would. They were clearly kind of social outcast geeks, nerds of the, of the, um, of the pond, and and they really befriended the the um, the robotic duck and these sort of tender moments where they would all hang out, the kind of the lame duck and the weird seagull and the robotic, you know, head wobbling duck would just like hang out together in the most delightful ways, and and of course the kids all understood this immediately. They understood. Uh, the social structure, who was the goose and who was the gander, who was the duck and who was the drake and, and who was paired with who and where there was their nesting grounds and how, you know, 
when a call was aggressive and when it wasn't. And, you know, it was, it's extraordinary how good we are at um, making sense of the world. Or the idea that many of us, you know, that the traditional paradigms of science where, you know, you do an experiment in a lab and, you know, I could run an experiment with my little genetically cloned um, trees and expose them to different variables and, and, uh, and run a controlled experiment and get some nice papers out of that. But to put them in public spaces all around the San Francisco Bay Area and expose them, you know, if, if you will, it's an uncontrolled experiment without you know, the reduced number of parameters to use means that I can get Troy Martinez, a construction worker, you know, I can learn from him. I can learn from the kids who were doing a literary uh, project that was sitting around drawing the trees and they noticed that the birds like to land in one tree and not the other tree. I can learn from, you know, much more diverse context, not um, things that I would, could never learn from, you know, from soil scientists or, um, you know, gene molecular geneticists about... Um, the tree growth responses. So it's it's that's I suppose what's thrilling to me um, in using wonder is to be able to um, draw and communicate across um, you know age, class, gender uh, issues to you know figure out why the trees look different. Um, and so it's less it's I think that's the communication kind of paradigm is is how we make sense of these very complex things together that's, um, that drives me. And to link that question with the previous question about your inspiration, um, you know, is there a sort of Dr. Doolittle element to this a little bit of the, you know, giving voices to the animals or was that a, a book that had an influence on you as a child? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm about to come out with a muscle choir. So stand by for the muscle choir, which is again very literally, you know, giving the little muscles um, <laughs> voices. I think that's that's um, not that I, um, you know, claim to speak for the animals or for the trees, but I certainly have a go at translating. Thanks. More questions? Yes, just up here, and then over there. Um, I mostly just have a question about your practice and the nature of your practice, which appears to have a much more scientific um, paradigm in terms of collaboration and uh, also sort of the ephemeral quality of the things that you make. And I'm wondering about your own sort of perspective on that because the, the only thing that I noticed in terms of things that are still around for many years are the trees. And that's usually a difficult place for artists to be where they, they have work, but the work doesn't you know, hang around, you can't sell it, you can't show it after it disappears. So I'm just wondering if you could chat about that a bit. Yeah, because uh, I think that's a really interesting and critical question about how, how to interface with the cultural institutions that demand that you have objects to show and hopefully sell and prints and things like that. So to some extent, I, I do have that. Um, and I try, I have a very nice gallery in New York City that tolerates, you know, being dragged into Department of Buildings court because they, um, and, you know, all sorts of things. And, and I do try and do prints and various things, but I'm, you know, I'm, my heart's not in it. Right? No, um, and I, um, and I, but I'd like to understand how to do that. I'm, you know, and I, I'm, I always find myself much more interested in the museum shop than being in the museum, right? So in the, um, I'm very interested in putting, you know, the hand flyers in museum stores, and less interested in putting them in in the gallery space, which is where I, you know, put them and hang them because, you know, because of the script of participation that people have when you're in a museum shop, you know, they pick it up and they use it and they play with and they, you know, they have, you know, buying something is a way of participating in something that's very legible to people. So, and, um, and so I'm really interested in how 
um, I find myself, you know, very engaged with the kind of producing the things. Um, in fact, I've started using a, a different term um, that I have to credit. Usman Huck actually used it to describe me. I like it called, um, I think of myself as a thinker as opposed to a, you know, a T-H-I-N-G-K-E-R. Um, and, you know, we're thinking with things as opposed to an intellectual, which is thinking without things or... So I, I, there's still, a, you know, there's a thingness that I'm very interested in, but it's, um, it's a kind of unruly um, fascination with um, natural phenomena and the... Um, you know, I'm much more interested in what, how the birds use the perches than the perches themselves, right? Um, you know, so it's, it just puts me in collision with the commodification of a professional art world, which is unfortunate because um, it would be better if I could figure out that relationship. Does your Paradox Oak project still exist? The paradox. Yeah, didn't the, you do? You did a project with oak trees. No, actually, the trees that I showed, um, they're the actually one? they're called the paradox tree. By Luther Burbank called them the paradox tree. Actually, those those okay. trees. So they're actually a F1 hybrid between a, a um, Juglans regia, a, a commercial walnut, an English okay. walnut, and a, um, a black walnut, a Californian native walnut. So. And Luther Burbank called them the paradox because they, um, they were the first uh, demonstration of hybrid vigor, this idea that two puny parents could create uh, you know, a vigorous kind of monster that was much larger and more robust and resilient than either of the parents. And so it, that's... So that is the project. I that's the paradox. Okay. Yeah, and there's been a few spin-offs from that, but the paradox there's actually even a paradox perfume because the leaves of those the paradox tree it's unbelievably um it's paradoxically <laughs> lovely thank you um and there was one over here i think yeah and then after that i think we have one more question uh, yeah. um right so most of the stuff that you've done have been a good combination of like function and aesthetic appeal so my question is, which one would you find more important for it to be appealing to people to do or function and which one requires more effort? Did you, make the, did you so plant did you, these, these hard questions? Is that what you did? Are you, are you saying which, which of function and aesthetic appeal are more important in yeah. the project? Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a very good and very hard question. And, and I don't know if I'm actually well equipped to answer it. I, I think that um, I would like my projects to have a higher production value and um, I get to work with wonderful, uh, Kat Kramer, uh, who's the exhibition designer and marvelous young designer who, um, to give it a kind of a polish that people recognize and kind of that je ne sais quoi of how things look in it. In it. But I don't. I can't separate them myself. You know how something works and how something looks. Um, I think I'm cognitively impaired in that way, and that I don't really know how to to disaggregate the function from the from how it looks. And really, I think you can recognise a certain aesthetic which um, has more kindly been called a, a Home Depot hack aesthetic um, that is um, characteristic of, of a certain commitment to, um, while I understand the value of making things beautiful, I'm much more interested in making them work or engaging other people to um, use them and perhaps make them more beautiful. I mean, so they are incomplete and they look incomplete, right? And I think that's actually perhaps a, um, a deliberate aesthetic strategy to invite um, participation as opposed to being kind of the precious, polished, complete, you know, work of art that 
um, should be, um, you know, should be admired and for its aesthetic, um, you know, res um, resolve as opposed to a kind of messy, you know, set of things that kind of hang together with a bit of gaff tape and and uh, are interesting to kind of poke and and play around with. So I think there's I fall on on the side of the less well produced. Okay, I think okay. Um, well, I did say one more question. We have uh, four more than one hand <laughs> Five. up. Five. <laughs> uh, gosh. Okay. Um, okay. Well, if you're very quick, maybe with your questions, let's. Uh, is it on? First of all, thanks very much. It's very good. Um, I just a quick question. Most of the stuff seems to happen in cities, uh, and it's on the fringes of cities. Um, and I just got this feeling of, of, of it being a kind of sick place. <laughs> the, 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 that's what came to me. Uh, and the other thing is that it's, it's a monoculture as well. We're all grouped together in this place, and we're just a single species operating in, in a very tight and controlled environment. And it, it, I just wondered what you thought about it. Is it a solvable problem? Or is it something that you kind of think, a lot of the things you're doing are happening on the edge of it, where, where nature's intersecting with that kind of monoculture? And I'm just wondering, do you think it's solvable, or is, is the problem larger than we would like to think? Yeah, I'm, I, I, I think I disagree with you a little bit. I think of what characterizes cities is their complexity, right? And the fact that there are all these hidden organisms that we literally don't recognize. Um, and there is the incredible diversity in how people see and understand and use things that we, that we hide in, um, we camouflage in urban order, but I think it's barely contained. I think it's cracking. I think it's, um, it's, uh, it is what best characterizes cities. You know, this recent thing that the UN, uh, UNEP did, um, the most extensive of which was in Paris, which was to to have a uh, citizen science project to look at count butterflies and um, insects um, in rural and urban areas. And uh, I mean, we've all known this for a, a long time, but um, it was a stunning result that was two orders of magnitude more biodiversity in metropolitan Paris than in the surrounding rural agricultural regions, right, when it came to butterfly counts. So, say again? Because they spray Because it's... And because um, our urban centers, we bring in our favorite um, lemon tree from Greece and some Australian uh, eucalypts and some, you know, and the kind of the biodiversity that characterizes the intensity of urban contexts. They are these islands of biodiversity. Every single city um, has, you know, these from the collective activities of many people having little gardens and window boxes and, you know, incredible biodiversity that supports. Um, uh, in DC, I've got a list of 180 butterflies that I'm trying to cater for with the butterfly bridge that, um, you know, so I think it's a barely hidden complexity that is is exciting and generative and and the opportunity the big cultural challenge is to go move away from the hygiene myth of order and and cleanliness and control of the 20th century to um, fostering biodiversity and this kind of it's a very different relationship to control and legibility of and you know believing in the the fact that we you know that actually roundabouts work better than red light intersections. I mean, these little instances in which we, we coordinate best in messy and unpredictable ways. Great, well, I, I yeah, <laughs> I, I did, there, this gentleman here has been waiting very patiently. So we might have just one more question and then I'm oh, But, I'm but we try. have to end with a question from a woman because it's women's oh, day. Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay. two questions. You. Okay, but keep it snappy, please. Um, I, I, just, I just want to know, how do you milk a snail? This. How do you milk a snail? Oh, okay. Here's a little <laughs> lesson, a quick workshop for you. Okay. It's very easy because you just put them in a, in a glass jar and you agitate them. I'm not by kind of annoying them, but by literally <laughs> physically agitating them. And then they start putting down slime because they, they want to, um, you know, they're trying to stabilize and they put down more and more and more slime. And then you take them out, and you have a nice little. So the, the milk is the slime. The There's milk no is the slime. Other, yes, it's 
It's just a more, um, more <laughs> delicious word than <laughs> snail slime. <laughs> and our final question of the evening. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Th that was the best, best Women's Day talk we could ever have wished for. Thank you so much. Um, just getting back to your ag bag, which I think is a brilliant idea, and how you like to transform the urban environment, I mean, to, to exploit the, some of the characteristics of the urban environment. And that led me to think about, you've, you've, you obviously understand very, very well how plants can, in, in one sense, rescue some of, or make up for some of our mistakes. And I, you did mention the Superfund site in the Hudson River, and I was wondering if you did have a magic wand and we could put aside our, our knowledge of agency and all the rest, would you have a bright idea which would circumvent those guys, you know, hoovering the stuff up and resuspending the solids and getting rid of the silt layer and all the rest? If, if you had a magic wand. If I have a magic wand, I think we could do it by putting those amphibious architecture arrays in and using the presence of animals themselves. Like mollusks and so forth? Or? Yeah, and the fish, you know, which of course, I know, you know, the EPA officer might say, you know, here's the pH and DO and temperature and salinity and here's your water quality. I much, I believe a scup or a, you know, a striped bass much more than I believe my EPA officer, you know, despite his PhD because, you know, they're there, right? And so the persuasiveness of um, organisms, being able to see whether organisms are there or not, whether they choose to, and what organisms do gives, a, a, I think, a, a wonderful insight into, it doesn't reduce it to a series of numbers that really, you know, are meaningless, right? But if fish find it habitable or can inhabit this context, that demonstrates um, that it's, you know, it is habitable. So I think the, the difference between the, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers and the way that we do environmental remediation, where we get, you know, big um, awards to clean up big areas is a radical disservice to what, you know, the complexity of our ecosystems that, you know, the, the, dredging, the dredging company that won the bid for dredging the Hudson is not looking at what the scup and the striped bass and the mussels are doing. And they're not engaging with the, uh, the people in the community who are observing that. And so the capacity to respond and say, well, you know, actually dredging it does seem to be resuspending and now there aren't any striped bass or scup or certainly the beaver's gotten out of here. What, you know, can we respond? Can we do it? So I can, I can imagine um, cleaning up waterways, getting the bulldozers out of environmental remediation with exercise programs, with many people doing an exercise challenge. I mean, actually digging and variegating the, the water um, shoreline. Um, for each linear foot we increase of shoreline, we have a thousandfold increase in environmental services. And digging that, you know, builds up your trapezius and your, you know, it's better than that lat pull down and your gym, right? And, and if you've dug it, if you dug a little part of that, that shoreline variegation, you know, you, you're going to keep watching it every time you walk past there or jog by and bring your kids back and bring your grandchildren back and say, you know, I built part of that. You know, that kind of engagement and enlistment of diverse people and the physical, you know, resources in addition to the intellectual resources that you can bring to bear on addressing these things. I see that as, as the most powerful force that we have in terms of environmental remediation. So that's the magic wand. I would invite you all to consider doing an environmental health exercise program and, you know, en masse really doing more than what any bulldozer or dredging company could do and bringing to bear the, you know, intelligent observations and ongoing monitoring that only we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for your questions and uh, very many thanks to Natalie for being with us tonight for this conversation. I hope you agree with me that it's been uh, fascinating and, and really 
I was so taken with that quote you had from Aristotle about uh, exercise and about uh, forming habits and the behavior repeated again and again. And it strikes me that you know, the ultimate persistence in your work is about new forms of behavior and persistence of behavior rather than something that you can slap on a wall. So thank you. It's been a, an amazing evening. So, and I, I hope uh, all of you will actually uh, be stimulated by this evening for um, our summer project, Hack the City at Science Gallery, which is looking at questions such as urban biodiversity and how we can intervene in urban systems. So once again, I'd, I'd just like you to join me in thanking Natalie Jeremy Jenko. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to add one more thanks to Michael John and his great team for, for making this science gallery. You don't know how lucky you are, you Dubliners. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Thank you, Michael John. Thank you.